Hello everyone here in the room, but also elsewhere on the world, uh, where, because we are streaming this session. We have the honor to have Henry Chesbro here uh, among us, and we have um, uh, a, question, a question and answer, a Q&A for, let's say, in the next 60 minutes. Uh, we will not lose time on uh, questioning Henry for a long time here from the audience, so we have already uh, a number of questions from, uh, in the, uh, gathered in the previous days, and I'm just going to mention already my first question to Henry. Um, open Innovation is 10 years old. Right? <laughs> so congratulations with that. Um, but do you have any idea how the practice uh, and the research about open innovation will evolve in the future? Ah, yes. Well, thank you very much and welcome, everybody. Uh, I, uh, maybe I'll start by saying uh, 10 years ago I did a search on Google uh, for the term open innovation because I was just finishing my book and I was curious, you know, what was out there. And... Uh, I got back about 200 page lengths uh, from Google, uh, and most of them had the uh, words open and innovation somewhere in the same sentence, like uh, this company opened its innovation office here. But at that time, there was really no meaning to the idea of having the word open and the word innovation next to each other. Uh, last month, I did uh, the same search on the same search engine, open innovation, 483 million page links came back, uh, most of them about uh, a new model of uh, innovation, how things are getting done. So uh, that's a very quick uh, summary statistic of what's happened in the last 10 years. Uh, so your question, Wim, where, where are we going? Uh, one thing that I will see is that uh, we're going global in that uh, I'm not saying that open innovation is going to work equally well everywhere. I suspect in North Korea it will be difficult for some time. Uh, I, the idea of uh, sharing knowledge uh, is going to be something that's going to come more easily some places than others as well. But there's no question that in terms of the, the evidence being collected, uh, the research being published, inquiries uh, coming to not simply me but to many people, are coming from many places all over the world. So that's one thing I would say, is it's not a story of how innovation happens in one industry in Silicon Valley. It's actually uh, a much broader pattern of innovation in many places. Uh, a second area where I, I see it going is that the role of universities is uh, becoming more and more central, I think, to innovation uh, in this open innovation model in particular, but more generally, uh, the creation of knowledge and the dissemination and, and training of knowledge. Uh, and I think we're going to see a very uh, positive competition among universities to become better catalysts to stimulate innovation uh, around the world. Uh, a third thing that I see uh, is gaining strength uh, are communities where you not only have a firm or two firms or even a value chain of firms, but you see uh, entire groups of peer-to-peer -peer, uh, people who share interests, who are coming together around topics and interests and uh, sharing knowledge, collaborating, sometimes competitively, sometimes collaboratively. Uh, I think we're going to see more and more of this as well. Since I want to hear lots of your questions, I'm going to try to keep my answer short, so I'm going to stop that answer there. We have a question from Mark Hufkens, and he is asking, what is your vision on foreground and background IP issues in open innovation? One of the things that open innovation brought to the, the fore, I think, is that uh, the way that we handle intellectual property has to become much more closely connected to innovation processes themselves. For a long time, we've known that IP can provide incentives for innovation on the one hand, but on the other hand, too innovation protection that's too strong can actually impair uh, follow-on uh, innovation later on. So you have to find a balance of, not, of no IP whatsoever, there's no incentive, but if IP is too strong, you, you strangle all the subsequent innovation that follows an initial one. When we start thinking about innovation and innovation, we now have to think about what's in the foreground what are things that are involved in a particular project or a particular collaboration that are being actively developed 
That's the foreground. But many of those things build on previous activities, previous discoveries that were done before. That's the background. And I would add to this question a third element, and that is the idea of proactively publishing some of the research results, not only to share knowledge with the world, which is a good thing in itself, but even strategically, you might choose to create a stronger intellectual commons from which you can draw innovation projects. And by growing the commons through publication, you can actually shape uh, the basis of competition either to neutralize someone who might have an advantage over you otherwise, or to invite many, many more into the process that otherwise might have been excluded. So we have to think about intellectual property in a more nuanced way with foreground, with background, and maybe this last one, no ground, or uh, sharing with everybody in the commons as well. Another question from Xian Yu is uh, how can a large firm, and here in this case it's about the food and beverage industry, but uh, we can generalize, I think, incorporate uh, corporate venturing as a part of open innovation? So corporate venturing is not something that came out of open innovation. Corporate venturing has been around a very long time. Uh, and indeed, many of the practices that are being grouped around open innovation, uh, individual elements of these practices have predated uh, the book of 10 years ago quite, uh, quite a bit. But there is, I think, now a framework to try to bring these together. What corporate venturing does in a world of open innovation is try to expand the paths to market that you can use for the ideas and technologies that you develop out of your own innovation activities. And by doing that, you can aim not simply at your current marketplace, but through corporate venturing, you can potentially discover different business models that enable these kinds of ideas and technologies to go to new places. So this suggests that innovation is not only about the development of new technologies and what we th classically think of as R&D, but through processes like corporate venturing, it actually also includes the discovery of new business models to commercialize that R&D. And corporate venturing is only one method of doing it, but I think a very useful method for exploring and ex experimenting with new business models. Okay. So another question from uh, Mr. Pawar is that uh, what are the commonalities and differences between a real world and digital uh, uh, open innovation setup? Uh, yeah, this question is a great one for anybody who's younger than the age of 30, I think. Um, analog people like me are, uh, I am a, a, a digital immigrant uh, in that I did not grow up in a digital culture. And m my life worked well long before we had all this digital stuff. So I actually have to unlearn things to learn about the digital world. And this is an area where I think uh, the younger scholars are going to really help educate many of the older scholars like myself how this is going to be. One of the things that I think we talk about sharing knowledge, uh, the digital environment does a wonderful job of sharing this kind of knowledge, anything that can be written down, that can be codified, uh, and these days now curated through peer-based or community-based processes, you can engage a very, very wide number of people on a diverse set of topics, and then through the curation, through the crowdsourcing, the filtering, and what have you, you can actually find uh, useful nuggets of information without being overwhelmed from the digital realm. And some companies will make their entire existence in the digital realm and build digitally based business models that engage these things. I was saying to Wim over lunch, one of my uh, students from uh, the course I just finished teaching in Berkeley is doing a startup around Bitcoin, the online digital currency, and he just got funded. Uh, so there, we're going to see another live experiment there. But uh, this domain is one where I'm going to be a student as much as a scholar. Explain what Bitcoin is, Henry. I'm trying to keep my answer short, so if you don't know what Bitcoin is, it's a digital-based currency not backed by any government, by any central bank. They, they already have funding. Yes, they're using real dollars to explore uh, activities in digital currencies. So remarkable, isn't it, right? Okay, so let's move to the, to the next question from Vesna Rafati. Um, isn't trust the fundamental requirement in any open innovation initiative? 
or are there any known business models for building trust in the context of a startup or an existing SME uh, pursuing open innovation? I have to uh, answer this question about trust, I think, in two ways. I think if you want to sustain open innovation, uh, you will need to develop processes to uh, elicit trust from those you work with. And to do that, you will yourself have to be trustworthy to do that. But I think we would be a little naive to say that we can assume that we can trust everybody from the very beginning. So I think there's going to be more of a dance that goes on uh, as we try to solve real problems and innovate new things uh, to find out who can we trust uh, and, can, and those in turn who work with us are going to ask the same question of us. Can we trust them? How do we know? How can we be sure? Uh, one group that I've gotten to know a little bit that's been very active uh, in open innovation is Procter & Gamble. Uh, and they tell me that they have had more than a thousand different collaboration partners over the 10 years that they've been practicing Connect and Develop. More, moreover, more than 60% of these collaborations have been with partners where they've done more than one collaboration together. So they've actually gone on to do a second, in some cases a third or subsequent ones. And I think that idea that you're doing uh, business repeatedly suggests that there is something to the idea that trust in those cases has been established, at least to the point where they're willing to do it a second time uh, and a third time. So I don't think we should be naive about this. I think you do have to be careful. But at the same time, I think there's some reason to be optimistic that uh, these things can be positive sum rather than zero sum, and that these kinds of collaborations uh, can sustain over time. So another question from uh, the same person is, what, uh, what are some contractual terms or legal forms that have been used succe uh, successfully in open innovation projects? Do you have any ex specific examples? Mm. Uh, so we have here with us in the room some folks that are studying uh, legal, legal dimensions in open innovation. So I'm sorry they aren't here to take this question for me, but uh, I'll just offer a couple. We've already heard about background and foreground intellectual property and the idea of no ground, of you know, public domain information. Uh, terms that I'm seeing uh, in licensing are uh, from everything or nothing, complete exclusivity for everything, uh, to terms like non-exclusive but royalty-free, or uh, non-exclusive and limited to one field of use, or exclusive but only in one field of use, so that intellectual property can be uh, sliced and diced, if you will, uh, both by geography, by field of use, by exclusivity or non-exclusivity, uh, in consortium models, uh, like one that Wim, Wim and I studied at IMEC uh, over here in Leuven, uh, you have people who are in the consortium who have intellectual property rights that people outside the consortium do not have, and they will have to find a way to pay in to get access to the same rights. So I think intellectual property is one of these areas that is developing quite rapidly uh, in this open innovation domain uh, and is a ripe area for more research. Can you extend a little bit on, for instance, uh, 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 innovation with strategic partners like uh, strategic suppliers and so on? Uh, how do legal forms act in, in this kind of uh, setups? You can, uh, I think you can think of uh, both uh, transactionally based legal forms where it's very contractual and you look at the letter of the contract and, and only what's in the agreement uh, legally, is are all, those are the only rights you have to a more relational one, where yes, there is a contract perhaps, but it's a relational contract that sets a framework within which you're going to do many things. And that second one is, I think, particularly relevant when you're trying to create something that does not already exist and cannot be fully specified in advance. Uh, where you, whenever you're doing something that's truly innovative, you often have those characteristics where you don't know exactly what you're going to end up with. So you cannot write a complete contract on all the outcomes of the collaboration because by definition, they're unknown at the outset. So you're going to need some more relational, flex flexible framework uh, to try to handle those. And sometimes you'll hear those called governance arrangements uh, or strategic alliances, strategic partnerships. But what these have in common are they're relationally based contracts that don't attempt to try to codify every eventuality, but try to establish some frameworks within which Collaboration can take place, uh, parties can take risk, with some amount of trust that there will be uh, a continuation and a chance to capture at least some of the value 
uh, that results from that. So, but if I understand correctly, open innovation and, and advances in open innovation will also challenge, let's say, new legal forms or different ways to, to, to work with legal forms? Uh, I have found some people from the legal community very excited about open innovation. I found many, many more who have uh, internal incentives in their organizations that are essentially anti-open innovation. Uh, the, the latter group, I think, have metrics geared to control, to keeping the company out of court, keeping the company out of trouble, defensive-based strategies for uh, IP. Uh, the, company, the, the smaller group that I think are much more excited uh, see open innovation in a positive, proactive, pro-innovative mode. And so uh, these firms are creating uh, these, these kinds of relational frameworks, uh, templates for working with a supplier versus working with a university versus working with an individual inventor versus working with a community, and that these different sources have different frameworks that you use to work with them. And I think this is where uh, some aspects of the legal world will be, go will be going over time. Okay, great. Um, a question from Paul Sloan. Uh, to succeed with open innovation, you need a culture which is open and sharing, but most companies are secretive and competitive. Do you see this as a barrier to open innovation? Well, I would certainly agree with the premise of the question, that the, the logic behind most companies uh, operating practices are uh, we want to own it, we want to control it, uh, we don't tell anybody about it until we're ready. Um, and if uh, when I'm trying to research a company, if I'm introduced to the company by the, the PR organization of the company, I know that's a bad sign, uh, that they are trying to control the message and it's uh, difficult. If I'm coming in through the R&D organization, it's more positive, there's more opportunity. Uh, so there is that difference. Within any large company, uh, there are going to be pockets of enthusiasm and pockets of resistance. It's not the case, uh, I've said P&G a couple times already, I'll say them one more time, uh, that all throughout Procter & Gamble, everybody is supportive of open innovation. No, the large companies don't work that way. They're much more complex. And so I think this gets to the essence of the question. To try to enter into open innovation, you're going to have to establish some proof of concept that in that organization, in this situation, open innovation can make a contribution. And until you can establish that, you're going to encounter a certain amount of skepticism, and perhaps you should encounter the skepticism. Because until you can demonstrate some basis for this in the organization, there will be plenty of corporate antibodies that are going to try to kill you, or at least get you out of the organization. So. Uh, I think there's going to be this kind of a, a learning process that goes on in companies where you start one place and then spread from there. Related to that question, you can ask if you, have the, if you just want to start open innovation, uh, what is a good recipe to start open innovation? Because you cannot uh, instill open innovation in, in, in the whole company if you're the size of a P&G or whatever, right? So uh, I'm going to be just a little bit facetious in, in my answer and say the best way that I think has been the most effective to establish open innovation is to have a crisis uh, and have your company be in serious business difficulty. And the reason a crisis can be so useful is I think if it really is a deep crisis, uh, the organization is willing to acknowledge that business as usual is not a very attractive option. So we know we cannot continue to operate the way we have. We may not be sure of what the new way should be, but we know we cannot continue down the same path. If you have that crisis, there's a moment where organizationally you can create organizational change at a fairly large scale. So in the companies that I think have been most aggressive in adopting open innovation, you've often seen a crisis followed by a, a CEO transition where somebody new has come in and has chosen to seize on open innovation as one of perhaps many tools to try to rejuvenate the organization, restore, restore growth, restore profitability, and so forth. It can be quite subtle. Uh, I know one organization I won't name in the U.S. that uh, announced a big open innovation initiative and then three months later had a big layoff in the organization. And in that same organization, because of that sequence of events, people thought that open innovation meant uh, outsourcing and getting rid of jobs internally in organizations like the R&D organization. Uh, that's, I think, a very dangerous place for open innovation to be viewed because then it is perceived by many as a threat to their own job. 
uh, in other organizations in the same industry, uh, the sequence was reversed, where they had a big layoff because of the crisis. Uh, and then as part of the recovery plan, they announced uh, an embrace of open innovation. And because of that, uh, the subsequent recovery was seen as associated with open innovation. And so instead of open innovation being seen as a philosophy that gets rid of jobs in the organization, it was actually seen as being useful uh, to help sustain and maybe even increase employment. So things like this, these subtle issues of timing when you have crises, can affect the perception of o open innovation or indeed any major organizational change initiative uh, in a company. From the same person, has crowdsourcing uh, been hijacked by the marketing department? Question mark. Is it becoming a PR tool rather than a research and innovation tool? So crowdsourcing has, ha I think, had a very successful uh, acceptance by a number of organizations and in different parts of different organizations, including uh, the marketing or public relations department. Uh, so I do think that it, it is true that crowdsourcing is being used there. Uh, I don't think it's true that it's only been, it's been hijacked to the point where it's no longer useful in other places. I think it remains useful uh, in many other places. And we're also learning that there are areas where crowdsourcing doesn't work very well, where instead of a crowd, you get a herd, a herd mentality all taking you one way. And the idea of crowdsourcing is you want multiple independent perspectives that when aggregated give you insight that wouldn't exist in any one of the individual people. But if the crowd becomes a mob and is influencing each other, they, instead of being representative and informative, they can actually become biased and take you in directions you actually don't want to go. So we're learning, I think, there also that there are limits to crowdsourcing as well as benefits. Okay. And then... Um, a uh, question from Ant Pascal Bayens, who is uh, here working at the TTO yeah, yeah. in New Hasselt. Um, if and how can university TTOs become part of the open innovation landscape? Uh, what are the implications for the IPR strategy of universities? I am not very popular among certain TTO executives for what I'm about to say. Uh, some university TTOs think that their job is to bring in as much royalty income as possible to the university each and every year. My own belief is that that is not the fundamental mission of a university. Uh, and that if you measure your performance on that basis, you are going to end up doing more harm than good. Uh, universities are fundamentally about the discovery and the dissemination of new knowledge. And the TTO should see its mission as part of that discovery and dissemination process. So there are ways of organizing TTOs to enable this by creating consortia, for example, that if you're doing something that's capital intensive and costs a lot of money, you're going to need some mechanism to give some group of companies an incentive to contribute enough to allow the research to be done. And so for some limited period of time, that group may have preferential rights to be able to commercialize that before everybody else does. And that, that, to me, I, I view as very positive because absent such an arrangement, you wouldn't have gotten the funding from industry to do the capital-intensive research to begin with. Having said that, however, uh, we don't want to create things that are too powerful and too strong because we do want to disseminate the knowledge to many places, not just from large companies, but to SMEs and to startups and individuals and in inventors and the like. And the, the TTO office is often spending too much time with the large companies and ignoring or frustrating the smaller ones. And so uh, I think the TTO mission has to be framed in the context of lar the larger university mission, uh, not maxima maximization of royalty income. Okay, that's clear. That's clear. Thank you. Um, another question here is, uh, what, is the, what is the role of social enterprise innovation? So uh, this is something that uh, it, at Berkeley, where I'm from, uh, many of our students are very excited about. Uh, they really like the idea of using uh, tools of uh, business and of management and applying them to social, the social sector, to social enterprises, social problems, problems that are not perhaps well addressed by profit-seeking corporations, but some of the tools and methods that are used in running those organizations could be helpfully applied to these other areas. Uh, we even have a global social venture competition that we host every year at Berkeley where we get uh, teams from around the world across 
70 or more different business schools to compete on social enterprise contests. So this, this is not specific to open innovation. This is more about uh, the social sector more generally. Where I think open innovation can make a contribution is how do we uh, activate the knowledge that is out there that can be brought to bear on social problems. Some of the methods like, uh, like crowdsourcing, the things we said about intellectual property, collaborations with universities, uh, venturing, these kinds of practices can be very helpful in the social sector as well. Now there are going to have to be differences when you try to bring a technique from the profit sector into the social sector. You can't simply just take it and use it. There are going to be changes and adaptations that have to be made. But I think it's a very useful uh, way to extend our understanding of open innovation processes on the one hand and then some of the outcomes and benefits from them on the other. We have several questions from Hert Verdonk, but I tried to summarize them in one main question. Uh, does open innovation have implications for public policy in general and innovation, uh, innovation policy in particular? Uh, well, thank you for this question. This is actually uh, an area that uh, uh, my interlocutor, Wim van Haverbecki, and I have actually collaborated on a project uh, ask, asking this question. And to some extent, I think, beginning to answer it. I, I would not claim that we have developed a complete answer by any means. Uh, but I, I would say a couple of things. Uh, much of the public policy that is out there is still based on the earlier closed model of innovation. Uh, take, for example, the idea of R&D subsidies. Uh, the rationale behind R&D subsidies is that companies underinvest in R&D privately because the spillovers that result from R&D spill over to others, and since the company doesn't capture those, they can only afford to do as a little bit, not as much as we in society would like them to do. So this is a, a rationale for providing R&D subsidies to get companies to do more. It'll still spill over, but the company gets more of the benefit since they get the subsidy as well. Well, all of this is premised on the closed model, that you have to invest in all the R&D to get the benefit. In an open model, you can have many parties participating in investing, and the benefits can flow many ways. An R&D subsidy in that model makes less sense, particularly on the D side. I think there are still excellent arguments to sustain strong investment in research. And indeed, I think you can make an argument that research investments get used even better in an open innovation model because the, the knowledge flows to more places and more people are going to get a chance to try to use that knowledge to solve problems. So the more we can invest in the fundamental underlying research, the more society has available to use through these open processes. So that's one thing I would say. Uh, another that uh, we looked at in the study uh, got back to this question of intellectual property protection uh, and how do you allow and motivate people to take risks on the one hand, uh, but recognize that much of the benefit of innovation is cumulative over time. It is not all a one-shot, uh, all or nothing. And so you have to find ways to do that. And in the EU context, you had the problem of having uh, patents in the, the several different countries uh, in Europe, the major countries, as well as the European-wide ones, the net effect of which was to have the cost of providing IP protection for SMEs and startups in Europe is much higher uh, than in other countries, in particular the U.S., but others too. And so how can we find ways to sort of uh, stop that and not tilt the table away from the SMEs and startups and create more of a level playing field uh, for them? Great. Um, I have another question from Karl Utendale. Uh, a little longer question. So if, we, if a whole r uh, region wants to reshape its economy, mm. it needs a critical mass of entrepreneurs willing to adhere to the principle of open innovation. It is my experience that too few entrepreneurs in Belgium or in Europe dare to share their dream with partners. What is your experience? Well, I do not have extensive experience of uh, startups in Belgium. So I, I don't want to uh, speak for Belgium in, in particular. Uh, but for I do provide advice to some SMEs and, and startups, including my Bitcoin startup for my students that are starting. And my message to them is, uh, by all means, uh, be open. But don't be open about everything. Have something that you keep to yourself that is private, that you don't share with everybody. And then have another part that surrounds that and maybe is complementary with that 
that you share quite widely. And by sharing that second part very, very widely, you can engage and get participation uh, and build some of the very positive dynamics that can unfold, but you still keep a certain piece of that for yourself. So I think that would be my advice to uh, an SME or startup, even in Belgium, uh, is uh, do share, do be open, uh, but keep a little something for yourself. Related to that, we are talking about SMEs. Do you think that SMEs, that only high-tech SMEs can, in, uh, can get involved in open innovation, or do you also think that uh, uh, more uh, SMEs in industry which, uh, which are selling commodities, low-tech uh, low SMEs and so on, that uh, they can benefit from open business models or open innovation? Uh, I would definitely answer that question uh, with the latter. That, uh, as we said in an earlier question, it isn't just about creating new R&D and new technology, but also about finding new business models and the experimentation that leads to that. Uh, in some of my most recent work where I've looked at innovation in service contexts, often uh, a service-based uh, business uh, has a great opportunity uh, to be very innovative, but not in the traditional high-tech way that we think about it. So ideas about co-creation with customers, uh, about the delivery uh, to customers, some of the digital domains that we were talking about in an earlier question all come into play. So I think it goes well beyond uh, the high-tech world. And so for SMEs and startups uh, in more commodity-based businesses, uh, if you take this broader view that it's not just about technology and R&D, but also about business models and uh, engaging with customers in these co-creating kinds of ways, uh, there's a lot there for them, too. Okay. So related to that, I want to add a question that just came in. Um, regions like northeast of England have many, many outstanding and technical capable, as, uh, capable uh, SMEs. We want them to engage positively with the open innovation strategies of major multinationals. But they have uh, little time and few contacts at the right level. What should they do, and how can the government eventually help? One of the things that really helps to share knowledge, even in this digitally rich world that we live in with you know, high-speed Internet uh, access to everywhere around the globe, is, uh, is people. If you really want to move knowledge, it really helps to move people. So if you're in a region like the northeast of, the, of England, uh, and you've got a lot of good stuff there, but it's not well known by some of the large companies you want to work with, you need to find ways to get uh, people circulating. So uh, you could try holding a conference if you want to just do something on a one-time basis to bring people in and show them what you have. You could send some of your people out to some of the hot spots for periods of time, and then bring back uh, what they learn and use them as carriers and connectors. Uh, you could create both uh, virtual online uh, collaboration spaces uh, as well as some uh, scholarships for executives and residents or sending some of your people out uh, to, to move people and knowledge around. Um, one of the things that a university can do in this kind of a context is that universities have, uh, amongst the other missions, the power to convene. A university can bring disparate people together uh, and get them collaborating and talking. And so even though we've got these wonderfully digitally rich environments, uh, I don't know about you all, but I find myself traveling and going to more meetings and conferences than ever. Uh, I don't think that's an accident. Uh, I think they actually are not replacements. I think they actually perform complementary functions. And so for people in the situation like this question, uh, my first set of thoughts is get connected. Uh, get those people uh, moving. Get, bring them to you, send yours to them, uh, rinse and repeat. Anything that the government can do about it? Uh, certainly in cases where the funds are not there to do it locally, the government, I think, can create more stimulus. Um, practices like that in the United States where our uh, immigration policies force people who've completed advanced degrees to go leave uh, is idiotic. Um, we are doing a terrible disservice to, to our economy. We are actually doing a positive service to the rest of the world by training people in a very good higher education system and then kicking them out. Um, now, I guess you could say that we're just playing a long game and we're trying to circulate people. Now, that would be giving us far too much credit. We're, believe me, it's not that well thought out. Um, 
But uh, that pro that's in the process of changing, actually, in the U.S. We're actually, I think, for the first time going to see some policies that recognize and value uh, trying to keep people from other places to stay. Uh, and I think attracting people from other places to come study with you or creating fellowships to send your people to study elsewhere and bring them back are, are policies to be encouraged. Uh, one that I've seen from many European universities is what sometimes is called the sandwich Ph.D., where you're admitted to the THD program in your European university, you spend the first year or two doing coursework, but at some point in your, the arc of your PhD, you spend one year somewhere else. That's the meat in the sandwich, and then you return to finish your program at that university. And that, that time you spend away, uh, you not only extend your own knowledge, but you also begin to broaden your connections and your understanding of context outside of one situation. I think this is a very useful uh, idea in a microcosm for how innovation will work well for policymakers uh, for regional uh, e innovation systems. Oh, great. Um, a similar question is uh, uh, from Luc Kent, and he asks, is there a quick win for corporates and SMEs in open innovation? Is there a quick win? And Luc is in the room, so you can eventually specify your question. Yeah. So to, if both sides know enough to know that there's a quick win, that works very well. Um, uh, the hardest part, of course, is how do I know what you know? How do you know what I know? Um, now, there are these uh, intermediary organizations that help to bridge some of this. Uh, and some of them have had, I think, uh, very successful records over time uh, with their clients. And that is, I think, a market demonstration that there's, there's value there. Open innovation. Uh, how you, where you start is a very interesting question. I would suggest that you look for something that has a high prospect for success and in a short period of time. It isn't enough to find an idea. You actually have to find that idea and then do something with the idea in your own organization to, the, to take that far enough where you get some kind of an outcome. And if you can get that in a short period of time, then you have something that I think is very important to an organization's acceptance of open innovation, and that is a quick win. Something that demonstrates clearly and credibly that there's something good happening here, and that in our organization, it actually can help. Once you give them that initial demonstration, then I think the willingness to try it again, maybe do a little bit more, do it a little bit bigger, uh, there's more permission uh, to keep going. As opposed to, uh, trust me, uh, we don't have results yet, but it's going to be worth it. And then years go by, and you still don't have anything to show for it. Uh, and you're still asking the organization to commit and invest. That's a very hard proposition to sustain. Great. You've mentioned already before that open innovation is going global, right? It's not only for uh, uh, companies in developed countries and developed economies. Um, there are some questions coming in, the, the, in the, uh, co questions about what open innovation can offer to companies in emerging uh, economies uh, that try to catch up with uh, competitors in the developed economies. And we have an additional question from, uh, in the same line from Ricardo Gallego. And he is asking, what is your recommendation for Latin American on open innovation, which is probably <laughs> related to my previous <laughs> question. So let me, let me speak generally, and then I'll try to talk to LATAM uh, more specifically. Uh, one thing that I'm seeing uh, that seems to be working pretty well is finding business models. Uh, let's say, with, let's go back to the digital domain question. Uh, finding business models that seem to work in one country in one context, and the experiment is let's try to copy that and do it over here. And then when you do that copy, you typically find that hmm, it needs to change a little bit, and then you start to iterate and modify and get to something that's more locally balanced, but you did start with something that was useful from the beginning. So you don't have to do the whole thing from scratch. You're really adapting, not simply copying, but you're adapting, or you might even say innovating, uh, business models from one domain into another. Uh, to give you a quick example of that, uh, a student and I did a study of Apple and Nokia in the U.S. and India. 
uh, this is two years ago, and um, the Apple business model for the iPhone and all that that you all know very well and you've heard all about does brilliantly in the U.S., and Apple's making a mint uh, doing it. What you may not know is that Apple is really struggling in India with the same model. And the reason the model doesn't work in India is that cell phone minutes in India are not sold on one- and two-year paid subscriptions in advance. Everybody is buying connectivity through these smart cards and SIMs and what have you, and it's a much more pay-as-you-go, uh, you use it when you need it kind of basis. So there's no carrier to subsidize the purchase of a handset in India. So that means an Apple iPhone is selling in India for eight or nine hundred dollars. And uh, apart from a very small percentage of the population at the top, eight or nine hundred dollars is a lot of money in any market. In India, it's a huge expense. So this isn't working very well for Apple. Meanwhile, poor Nokia, which has taken a terrible beating in the U.S. and is and really struggling, their business model works really well in India, and they're actually, even today, doing much better and much uh, more effectively than you might expect. Uh, and it's because their business model works well in India. So what this suggests is that, again, it's not just about technology and R&D when we think about open innovation. It's also about these business models. And in these emerging markets, the business models in the emerging markets have, have different imperatives than what exists in the fully developed advanced, in quotation marks, uh, economies. Um, with Latin America, um, you have, uh, you know, El Colosso del Norte, uh, that huge economy to the north of you that often is pulling and sucking a lot of things in. It can be a fantastic market. Uh, even just the Latin American uh, Hispanic population in the U.S. is by itself a huge market now. Uh, it's going to be in, in states like California, where I come from, the Hispanic community is now, I think, about 40% of the state population. So just serving, even still in Spanish, uh, this marketplace can be fantastic for you. Uh, where Latin America, I think, really needs to focus a lot, uh, one of the things we talked about already was the role of the university. Uh, Latin American universities have not yet really embraced the vision of open innovation, and uh, I think they're... Uh, they can play a much bigger role than they currently do uh, to both bring industry and university together to work with not just large companies but also startups to allow faculty in these organizations to have more access with industry than they often do uh, and even to grant leaves of absence to faculty who might want to take a period of time to try a startup. Uh, these are all policies that are rarely available in Latin American universities and I think have a lot to commend them. Thank you. Um, how do you see human resource management in open innovation? A question from one of our students, Fena Paul. Well, yeah, this links nicely to an earlier question because we talked about if you want to move knowledge, ultimately you've got to move people. And human resource practices can enable that or they can stand in the way of that. Um, so I think this is an area where we don't have a lot of uh, great research in open innovation yet, but I think the premise that there's a lot to learn there is exactly right. Um, one thing that I think has contributed uh, to the movement of people is things like portability of pensions. If your pension is dependent on staying with your employer, and if you leave, you lose that, uh, and you have to start at the beginning, which is the case in many companies in Japan, for example, uh, that creates a very strong barrier to movement. Uh, and whether the business is doing well or badly, your, your human resources are really bottled up inside these large companies. And the large companies, in turn, have people in their 40s, 50s. What do they do with these people? Uh, they're no longer at the state of the art, but uh, their pension is dependent on that, and they have nowhere to go. And so you have uh, a big problem there. Uh, I think creating portability of pensions so that you can take your pension with you if you leave, and you don't lose it, but it goes with you, uh, would be a partial solution to encouraging more mobility and maybe liberating some of that... Uh, pent-up human capital that really is not being productively employed anymore, but doesn't have anywhere to go for fear of losing these things. So that's just one specific human resource practice. Uh, others that we can think about would be uh, these non-compete agreements, employment agreements, non-disclosure practices. Uh, all of these things in an open innovation framework uh, could and should be rethought.
Then another question, uh, over 10 years of open innovation, do you have any failures or shortcomings with the model? Or do you see any shortcomings in the model? Sorry. And then what lessons were learned and what are the, your recommendations to avoid these failures? So a question of Patrick Francois. So um, I can take Patrick's question on two levels. I'm going to talk both about the model and then about uh, the practice. Uh, I am convinced that there are great examples out there where open innovation crashed and burned, and it was a disaster. We don't hear about that, though. It turns out that companies are not eager, they're very willing to share the things that work. Uh, and you can see why they would. They tend to be a little less enthusiastic about telling you what a great mistake we made. Um, and so uh, those of us uh, from the academic side that are studying this, uh, are limited to some extent because we're only seeing part of the experience. It's hard to really get good data on the things that didn't work well. So that's, I think, uh, something that's uh, going to an area for opportunity to develop further uh, the, the theory because we need more, more data to evaluate on the negative side as well as the positive side. With regard to the open innovation model itself, um, one thing with the benefit of 10 years of hindsight that I realize now is that uh, open innovation and these 483 million page links, uh, the good news is it's really become widespread. Uh, the bad news is uh, what does the term open innovation mean in those 483 million page links? Does it all mean the same thing? No, it doesn't. Uh, it's become a buzzword for many things, uh, some of which uh, sound kind of like open innovation as I was originally thinking of it 10 years ago, uh, some of which I can't recognize at all. Uh, it's like, well, it sounds good, but that's not open innovation. I mean, that's, that's a whole other thing. Uh, so I don't know how to uh, go back and correct that. But I would say that is something that as a model has really uh, is creating problems now is a lot of people th say they, they like open innovation, may even say they're d practicing open innovation, but they actually mean something that's quite different from what uh, many of us who are studying it are actually saying. So that's um, something that, as, a, as a, both an academy and just in the wider world, being clear about what it is and what it is not uh, is something that I think uh, could make a big improvement. Okay. Open innovation had a, a big impact in the last 10 years on, on practice, on innovation practice. But what is, according to you, the major challenges of open innovation uh, related to theory of innovation, if, if any. So in a, uh, if you go back to, let's say, the 1950s when uh, uh, Ken Arrow uh, came up with the insight that uh, research and development creates these economic spillovers, and uh, that is good for society because the knowledge is spilling over to many others, including those who didn't pay for it to begin with. Um, but it creates a problem for the firm because the firm spends all this money uh, investing in R&D, and then it doesn't capture all of the results. And so it, it, over time, if, that, if the leakage becomes too big, the firm cannot sustain continued spending on innovation. So uh, since the 1950s, there's been a lot written about economic spillovers. And one way to think about what open innovation contributes to uh, theories of innovation is uh, whether it's absorptive capacity uh, or other ways of thinking about bringing knowledge in as well as letting knowledge going out. Prior to open innovation, uh, terms like spillovers were what were used to describe these things. And they essentially were judged to be uh, a necessary cost of doing innovation. It's too bad these things spill over, but there's not much you can do about it. Or absorptive capacity is a really good thing, so you should spend money on internal innovation because you'll do a better job of absorbing external knowledge as well. What open innovation contributes is how do you structure the, the knowledge flows from the outside coming in, and indeed they can be structured. Not all of them, but some of them can be. And alternatively, when things go outside, you can structure part of those as well. And so turning spillovers into more structured, more managed inflows and outflows of knowledge is one of the contributions that open innovation offers to theories of innovation more generally. Okay. 
Nice. Um, in the same way, but then, well, the, the question comes from Johan Leeten from uh, VOCA. And he asked, uh, has there been a quantitative study benchmarking the performance of open innovation firms on the one hand and traditional innovation firms on the other hand? Or the significant differences? Um, I would add to this question, while well, we have been both members of a jury of a PhD defense this morning here in Hasselt, uh, where hard data are, 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 uh, are used uh, to, uh, to have some empirical research for a large uh, European company. So maybe we can integrate that into, into this question here. So the, uh, the, the gold standard for evidence to support open innovation would be something very much like what the question just asked. If we had two similar firms, well, if we're going to be stylized, let's say if we had two identical firms, one of which was open, one of which was not, and they both undertake innovation activities, who gets the better result? That would be the, the, the test we'd really want to do and be able to control for these other things. Uh, that study has not been done. Um, and so the empirical data that support uh, the usefulness of open innovation are, are based instead on proxies. Uh, proxies like the community innovation surveys that are done in many of the European countries and indeed many of the OECD countries. And where uh, academic scholars uh, like Eamon Salter and Kel Lauerson, for example, are showing that if you look at proxies for inflows of knowledge, in these community innovation surveys, and you then correlate those with innovation outcomes, uh, like the percentage of revenue from new products and things like this, you can find a statistically positive correlation showing that firms that make greater use of external knowledge achieve more positive innovation outcomes. Now, that's not causality. That's a correlation. Um, and the, uh, the implication of that is maybe open innovation is helping. Today, uh, Wim and I sat on a jury where a, a PhD candidate successfully defended a thesis within a single firm, looking at a variety of research and development projects done within that firm over a seven-year period of time, where uh, each of these R&D projects, uh, some of which were, had, had little or no open innovation element to them whatsoever, others of which had quite an extensive open innovation element, what were the project outcomes of these? And uh, the thesis was able to show that uh, a correlation between the more open projects were getting better results compared to the R&D projects that had less of this. Now, there still is the question about the prior selection. Uh, did the, uh, the more open projects have better managers? Did the more open projects have bigger economic potential from the beginning? And it's difficult because we can't repeat the experiment as we can in the natural sciences. It's difficult to completely rule these things out. But so given those limitations, nonetheless, it's very strong correlation evidence that in this one organization, uh, doing more open innovation at the R&D project level was giving you better outcomes. Uh, it's not a complete airtight causal demonstration, but for those of us who work uh, in industry, it's pretty darn convincing. Uh, I think I would be quite comfortable standing up in front of a group of managers and saying, did you know that this company had this result? Now, does that mean it will work in your company? We don't know yet. We haven't tried it yet. But here's why we think it worked in this organization and what it might mean for you. I think a lot of managers would find that pretty interesting and would want to begin to explore this. So as we get better data, I think we're going to see uh, even more interest as a result. So is the conclusion then now that we should uh, look for more data from companies uh, because this hard empirical data uh, gives us more evidence that there is indeed a, a connection, for instance, between open innovation practices or good open innovation practices and the innovation performance? So should we really uh, look I at I would say it slightly differently. Why would a company be willing to give us academics that data? You know, because it takes a lot of work to generate these data and then answer all the annoying questions that academics ask about it. And how did, what is this variable? What does it mean? And how did you measure it? And who collected it? And, and this is annoying if you're a manager. It's like, you know, leave me alone. Um, but if we can actually say, we think you might have an opportunity to improve the R&D performance of projects in your organization, 
and here are the data we're going to need to help you figure out if that's true, some companies might say, yeah, I care enough about that that I might let you have my data, and I might let you um, ask me all those annoying questions and help me figure that out. So uh, to me, it's a more positive answer to your question, whereas I think managers actually might want, based on this most recent thesis, managers might be willing to, to come across with that. At least in this case that uh, we have seen this morning, uh, that was certainly a positive interaction between management and the researchers. And I noticed that uh, w one of the uh, people from the organization that provided the data was there at the defense, and during the defense, there was a discussion of new research projects. Exactly. So uh, that, to me, is I think a very uh, convincing uh, exactly. demonstration that th that manager felt this was worth continuing. Exactly. I have another question from Anne Pascal Baines. Um, how important is the marketing department of universities or companies in open innovation model? In the uh, traditional, more closed model, uh, the role of marketing was to take whatever it was that engineering developed and go try to sell it. Um, I think in a more open model, uh, in a more digitally enhanced world, uh, there are a lot of ways where customers, consumers, users can, can and need to interact much more directly and immediately with the innovation process. If the marketing organization can organize itself to be part of that and really help enable it and facilitate and drive, etc., then uh, there's a tremendous role. If the marketing department is going to somehow get in the way of all that, uh, it could become irrelevant. So I think uh, it depends a little bit on how the marketing organization views its role in innovation. To, to me, as I watch what many industries are doing, there's no question that uh, we're going to see more ways and deeper engagement uh, with these external parties. And so the marketing organization better get on board with that if they're going to remain relevant. Related to that, do you, do you, did you see already any mixing of open innovation with uh uh, branding, co-branding exercises, so really the marketing department that takes the lead in open innovation? Well, it's interesting because I know the marketing organization thinks that they own the brand. Okay, sure. Um, but a lot of uh, research is showing that ultimately it is the experience of consumers that define what the brand really is. And yes, marketing can shape that and can influence it, but they can, I think, no longer dictate it. Uh, and that uh, gets back to this idea of co-creation, that uh, if you try to dictate it, that's a one-way interaction. Um, that's probably not going to be a very effective engagement model uh, to truly innovate with your customers. If instead you uh, create a conversation that you help to organize uh, with uh, people in the community, then I think you have a chance. Uh, I know in the uh, consumer packaged goods area, uh, there are a lot of moms with young babies, for example, that are blogging regularly about infant formula or babies' diapers or a variety of safety things for cribs and high chairs, etc. And they are the ones that are shaping the perception of the brands in those areas. If the marketing department ignores that, uh, then they are at great risk of finding that the brand is going to get away from them. And you cannot simply tell these people what to think or what to say. Uh, they are, they're writing from their own direct experience, and through these digital channels, they have ways now of sharing that experience with thousands or even millions of people. Uh, so this is a force you cannot fight. Uh, you have to find a way to engage with it. Uh, you cannot fight it. And I have a question from Jan Verlaak. Uh, how can an SME or a startup protect itself from being taken over by big companies? That might be like a side, side effect of open innovation, right? Well, let's see. Um, if the price is right, uh, many SMEs would be delighted to be taken over <laughs> by a large company. Um, I think maybe a more interesting variant of the question is, how can the SME avoid being exploited by the large company? And there, I think there's reason for concern because a large company has these very well-established processes. They have a lot of bargaining leverage. There's little you and there's big them. How do you avoid simply being completely exploited? Um, and part of that, I think, gets back to what we said earlier. Have a little something you keep to yourself and you don't disclose everything. 
Uh, part of it has to do that you have to create outside options for yourself as well. If you become too dependent on just that one company, then I think you do become at great risk for being exploited. Even if the large company doesn't truly intend to, they can just make so many demands on you in the course of doing their daily business that you respond to that you lose all your bandwidth for dealing with any of your other customers. There, they're not actively trying to exploit you, but the effect is almost the same. So uh, as a small businessman, you have to remain agile. You have to remain focused not only on that one company, but on your outside options. And you have to keep a little something for yourself that you don't give away. Uh, sometimes that might be a patent. Uh, sometimes that might be a trade secret. Uh, it could be your own brand. But things that you, you keep for yourself that don't go to the large company. Instead of having the last question myself, I jump to the audience and I give you the last question. What is your name? What is your name, please? So yeah, so I'm going to repeat the question just because uh, those of us who are listening online can't, couldn't hear the question. So uh, looking at the high-tech campus in Eindhoven as an example of a very successful, uh, let's call it an innovation hotspot, uh, an environment that really has created lots of interaction and stimulates a lot of good stuff going on, anchored both by the uh, I University of Eindhoven but also Philips and these large organizations, what can small organizations do to similarly uh, position themselves to take advantage of uh, and, and maybe make some of their own hot spots uh, and things more on their own terms. Um, for some reason the area that this uh, occurred to me was in the arts that uh, artists are uh, often looking for these kinds of opportunities themselves or small companies uh, trying to uh, organize things in ways that help stimulate them that, to their advantage as your question asks. So one thing is to think about, even as a small company, to think not only about your organization, but about the wider environment. Maybe you're part of a movement. So think of 3D printing. Uh, right now, a lot of there are these maker fairs where people are coming together and using uh, methods like mass customization and 3D printing to do very uh, individually based uh, businesses for custom stuff but not with, uh, not a bespoke model of uh, very expensive stuff, but a much more scalable modular model where you've got interlocking and, and intermixing parts that can be mixed and matched together. So the maker fairs bring, come together and bring these people together. The people who organize those fairs get to build all those connections. Uh, they get to learn who all these people are. Uh, and then as they go back to their own business uh, at the end of the, uh, the fair or the conference, uh, and they're doing their ordinary business, they're better known, they can reach out to more people, more people know who they are and where they're from, and so by, in a sense, giving to the community by organizing them and bringing them together, they get a temporary advantage to go further with them. Now, that by itself will dissipate over time unless they renew and sustain and do more, but I think for a, a small company, uh, the idea of trying to... Uh, contribute something and give something to others beyond yourself uh, and then finding giving them real value uh, might get them more interested in who you are uh, and give you some advantages in doing more with them. We have to finish Henry, the 60 ah. minutes are gone. Uh, this was I think a very inspiring hour. Uh, thank you for all the answers. It's time to go to the ceremony where Henry going to have an uh, honorary doctorate from the U Hasselt. So, uh, and uh, we have to move on. Thank you for the audience for all yeah, the thank questions. Thank you for coming.